and welcome to the first episode of Weighed In of 2023. It's a happy new year from the Betfair team to our loyal listeners. Oh, it's great. We're starting the new year with a bang, Kevin Blake, because we have so much racing to get through. My goodness me, it has been a busy, festive period. We're going to review the action and we're also going to cover a few of the news topics too. But to kick off the show, any New Year's resolutions, Kevin Blake? I had to get better every day, Vanessa, the same one as always. But uh, yeah, we, we have a whole heap to get through. Like, geez, it's, it's, it'd be probably one of the more intense kind of six days of the entire jump season, really, what we've just gone through and um, endless horses to talk about. So I won't gibber on any longer. Good, good. Um, what about UTC? Is setting the stall out and anything new this year or is it? Yeah, I'm I'm absolutely gutted we're recording this at 12 o'clock because I was uh, I was hoping to catch the two runner novices chase at Plumpton uh, at 12.30. So I'm absolutely devastated I won't be able to tune in live for that. Well, it's a new year, but we still have TC's sarcasm with us. Oh, no, it, it's only a two runner race because Mortlack, who was meant to run on New Year's Day, was pulled out of there to go here for the two runner novice chase at Plumpton. Couldn't, couldn't make it up, could you, TC? Look. Um, right, let's kick off with a review of the Christmas racing. As Kevin has touched upon, just loads to get through. Uh, we're going to start off with the open divisions of all. Um, well, we're going to kick off actually with the Gold Cup picture. Obviously, Brave Man's Game winning the King George feels like a long time ago now. Um, but he did it in emphatic style, Kevin. Were you impressed and... What do we say about his profile as a Gold Cup horse? Yeah, like, like I think um, the front two, if we'll refer to him that way, Long Press obviously didn't finish, but the two main players, like for me, they both enhanced their credentials um, in general and, and potentially both as Gold Cup contenders. Um, Brave Man's game, like the, the, I suppose one of the lingering things with him, and we've talked about it loads on here, is the, the thought that how much will he find when, he, when the, the tank is really dipped? And we didn't get the full answer here because of Long Press's departure, but it looked like he was coming out on top. Um, like the official form note has him three lengths ahead when left clear. He was no more three lengths clear now than the man in the moon. Like he was hardly, hardly more than a length clear um, to my eye, but but there you go. Um, and look, the thing about Brave Man's game, what was admirable about it was, like I'd say Harry Cobden, if you if you put him down at the start again, he would have ridden the race a bit differently. He oh, you can say him. it, Kevin. It was one of the worst winning rides you'll see in a while. Um, I wouldn't go quite that far, but like it's it's one of those tricky situations where Long Press started jumping left into Brave Man's Games path, and and Harry, you know, I, I'd say had probably set out with a view to having the outer or certainly having access to the outer, and he had that tricky decision to make in the heat of the moment. You know, do you take away from your plan A to get away from this yoke jumping left on top of you the whole way? Or do you persevere and chart a bit of a wide path? He decided to chart a bit of a wide path, got interfered with, you know, quite a bit. Like, and, that, and, and ended up being quite wide around Kempton, which, which is not good. Um, and I thought it was to his credit that he was able to um, come back and, and get on top of Long Press. Um, how far would he have won if Long Press hadn't unseated? A tricky question to answer. I, I I guess a couple of lengths. I would, I don't think he would have cleared away. Would be my own view. But look, that represented a good performance. My clear the rest. Um, there's a strong view in there, Vanessa, that he's not a Cheltenham horse. Um, I I can't have that. You know what are you basing it on? You you know he, he ran quite well in the Ballymore. You know two years ago now. Um, like, are you basing it on that? Like, I think that'd be extremely tough to do that. Um, I think he's fully entitled to go to Cheltenham. Will he? Will he want the greater stamina test that the Gold Cup represents? Now, that's a fair question, but I don't think the track itself um, should be an issue. Like, he, I think because of what Long Press was doing, I don't think it was the best display of jumping we've ever seen from Brave Man's game. Um, so you can upgrade him a little bit on that again. But the guy thought it was very good from him. But Long Press, I, I, I thought that was a huge run from him, Vanessa, because uh, he hated the track at Kempton. Like he was jumping notably left throughout, losing loads of ground um, and was still hanging in there. Like I say, not much more than a length down at the last, was sticking on well. Um, he will love getting back to Cheltenham. Going uh, particularly going that way around 
we we know from the Brown Advisory last year that that, that he operates he operates very well around there, and I wouldn't be giving up on him. I, I was questioning where the handicapper got kind of carried away by putting him up to one seventy after Newcastle, but um, for me he enhanced himself in defeat here, in even in non completion, and um, hopefully we'll see him one more time before the Gold Cup. But uh, I would certainly still have him in the mix as a Gold Cup contender. Okay, so positives about the home press and not that many negatives about Brave Man's game going to Cheltenham either from Kevin TC. Uh, do you concur with those views? Yeah, nothing much to add, really. I just think, obviously, they, they seem set on going straight to the Gold Cup with Brave Man's game. Now, I just wonder whether they will have a change of heart if something, if Alaho doesn't get there. Does the Ryanair without Alaho mm -hmm. looks a bit of a gimme? And obviously... A, I've got the horse wrong, you know, wrong all day long from from last year onwards. When I thought he was a um, a dubious star over two mile five in that grad, that you know that that graduation chase at Haydock on, on Betfair Chase Day. Um, no, um, obviously the market, you know, the, he was a he was a drifter on the day. He drifted out to probably the price he should have been, but clearly the the, the first price about him was the right price. The way he won, uh, yeah. The second obviously ran a very good race, very soft unseat and. I don't know what Charlie George is on about when he's saying about he was blaming the sun for, for him and the horse, etc. I mean, the horse has jumped left before, so I don't think it had anything to do with the sun. Um, I think he'd be better off not saying that because it makes him look a bit foolish, I thought. But no, nothing much really. Very impressive winner. Second would have run a really good race in a, in a Cheltenham trial as well. Uh, but other than that, no, nothing more to add. OK, on to New Year's Day. We're going to stick with the sort of doing this in categories and still with the open chases. Great to see Manella Indo back in the winner's enclosure at Tramor. Um, cut from 33s to 20s for the Gold Cup off beating Statler, not very far at all in the finish. Kevin, who would you take out of the race moving ahead to the Gold Cup? I'd take Statler. I thought Statler ran an absolute belter. The two of them did. Um, fantastic race and look first and foremost on a kind of a human level you'd be delighted for Henry de Bromhead and his family and um, you can see how much that meant there post race um, it's their local track they only train just down the road and um, big crowd turned up you know clearly that was the result the crowd wanted they got it um, and, and that was great for them but look Manel Indo clearly stays much better than this race tested um, two miles six around Tremor, like running around a saucer, and they didn't go over quick either. You know, the finishing speed was quite sharp. So I think the front two will both be better suited by further, you know, more pace and um, bigger track, etc. But like Manel Indo did his usual trick, he kind of got there to the front two out, pricked his ears, um, probably was headed and fought back and got back up to win. But Statler, like, like people are sleeping on Statler, I think, Vanessa. I, I this was only his his fourth run over fences. Well, I thought he was on that note, Kev. It's really interesting because he was unchanged at fourteens. I mean, these prices are open to change, subject to change. But at fourteens, he was unchanged after this result. Whereas I, I was with you, I thought he was the horse to take out of the race for the Gold Cup. Like fourth run of his life over fences. He's had to give away eight pounds to a Gold Cup winner who still is a force. I feel. In this division now will he win another gold cup i don't think so but he, he's certainly going to be in the mix in all those top chases yeah. and statler you know he he won the three mile sixer last year and he's back around tremor over two mile six and you know he had a right crack at Manel, Manel Indo and only gave best close so I, I thought it was a mighty run yeah. it really was um i don't know what they're going to do hopefully they'll go to the irish gold cup we'll get excuse me we'll get a look at him in amongst all those top ones again before Cheltenham, um, you, you'd love you'd love to see another run really before Cheltenham, um, but I, I put him up as the start of the season as my kind of sleeper in the Gold Cup market. And geez, I know he was beaten, but God, you, he couldn't have done much more, um, you know, other than go win the race. But I thought this was really encouraging. Um, his jumping was was good. Um, you know, he's a little bit big early. You know, clever when he needed to be. And, and did absolutely nothing wrong. So sat there, I would be really encouraged by. Okay, well, if he does go to the Irish Gold Cup at the Dublin Racing Festival at the start of February, TC, he's yeah, likely yeah. to bump into Conflated, who's now 14s for the Cheltenham Gold Cup, having won the Savills at Leopardstown, uh, back at his favourite track. And you presume that he'll, he'll like I say, head there in February as well. Yeah. Um, 
were you I mean I can't have conflated in a month of Sundays he's he's not a very liked horse this horse <laughs> I, I backed him at 16s on the exchange after for the gold cup after that um mm. I was quite taken although you know you can't go can't go overboard uh about a five length beating of Ken boy but you know the Irish gold cup form when he beat Manero Indo I think it was six and a half lengths last year was um was obviously a very good performance went back and had a look at the Ryanair again when he fell two out you know he you know he wasn't making any inroads but oh, but that's an exceptional winner Alaho isn't he so yeah I was I was saw enough in that at 16 so again he was very weak on the day he you know, he trebled in price at down royal first time out and he was you know hit five to two even after Aplutar came out uh, before the race and you know he, he belied the market weakness there again so yeah I mean yeah and the the, tra- the the owners come out and said you know even though he obviously he's he wants to win a Ryanair. He said, this horse is going Gold Cup. Yeah, I, I can see that 16s. It's a very open Gold Cup. And um, and uh, conflating at 16s, I thought it was a I thought it was a fair win only price. I wouldn't go overboard, but I, I've had a small bit on him. Okay. And he just he just frustrates you a small bit, Vanessa, because like I, I was kind of half he was my outsider of choice read in the Gold Cup last year, and that they decided to go to Ryanair. Um, and I suppose here we saw what we've seen from him before and that he's just a bit inconsistent with his jumping. Like he's, he's quite good most of the time, but he can just get a bit sticky and get a bit out to his right in places. Uh, and it just places a little doubt in your mind. And we saw he, he paid the ultimate price at Cheltenham last year when he, when he came down and he's, he's lost his rider before. And um, like the talent is there, you know, it was it was sleeping inside him for quite some time, but it's very much out there now. But you, he's one of those that if he if he did put everything together on the day and his jumping stayed good and clean, you know, he could be capable of doing anything. But that, that inconsistency in his jumping just would be a little niggle in my mind. Just, just before we move on with the Gold Cup, we should mention obviously Yaku Tar came out of that race on the day because he banged a joint. Um, but apparently all, all's well now. And imagine he'll go to the Dublin Racing Festival, all being all been good with the horse, but and he, and he and crucially he hasn't really shifted on the exchange. He's still around about ten to one mark on the exchange, so there's no there's no kind of lingering weakness in him uh, going forward. It seems well, not from the market anyway. Big big price, TC. Well, Aplutar. Big price. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like Thank I said, you. when we do these, I, I went back and had a look at looks all the trust uh, uh, festival ones. It's, it's it was you know that finishing kick of Aplutar last year was unnatural. You know it's. And, you know, Henry has a couple of them. I mean, I remember Tell Me Something Girl a couple of years ago, was it last year? And, yeah, it's just unnatural, uh, you know, unnatural finishing kick. I mean, if that horse gets in the same form, you yeah. know, mm-hmm. going to have to be every every bit as good as they say he is, and then some to be that kind of uh, apple it, tie that form. It's always, it always amazes me how quickly people forget performances that only happened last season. Just, you know, when a horse's profile, like a Plutard, starts to go in the wrong direction, obviously off the back of Haydock and then the knock joint. So quick, the good performances go from people's minds. And then that's obviously reflects in the prices. But we must plough on. Champion hurdle picture, obviously star performance of the Christmas racing period goes to Constitution Hill. I think it's fair to say at Kempton on Boxing Day. Uh, in the Christmas hurdle, emphatic again, uh, winning by however many lengths he likes. You can bang on about him all day long, but really the angle is what is going to give him a race in the champion hurdle. He looks like he's going to go off the shortest price favourite for the champion hurdle, potentially ever. Um, but then Stateman comes along and, you know, he puts an effort in there that keeps a small element of competitiveness alive, I think it's fair to say, in the champion hurdle, Kev. He's now fours from fives for March off the back of the Leopardstown win. And look, at least, I mean, we needed him to win, didn't we? We really needed him to win for just for something to talk about when it comes to the champion hurdle away from Constitution Hill. Yeah, like it's it's, it's such a such a weird game, this isn't it? Like we've been bemoaning for you know you so long that oh, we're lacking a real star in the hurdle division, and now we have like potentially one of the best hurdlers of all time. It's, you know, we're like ah, there's nothing to take him on with. You know, it's um, it's a bit perverse, but look, Steve Man is definitely one of the, is for me is the most interesting one kind of emerging to take him on. Um, he was he was good at Punchestown. He was probably better here. Um, like his jumping is 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 fine. I, I for me, not much better than fine. Like he never gets himself in any trouble or anything, but he's just not a, 
uh, super slick or highly efficient jumper that you would associate with it with a tip top two miler but um it you know i think that that is what it is i don't know if he'll ever be one of those but it, it's not stopping him going winning grade ones so we, we won't pick too strong at him and he was very good here he was in control the whole way and ultimately won won very well um like Vauban, a lot of people were getting very excited about him. Um, and look, it was certainly a career best. Expectations from the Mullins camp seemed to be low enough. Um, and I think they were, they were very happy in that context. And sure, look, there was plenty to like about it. Again, like he's not a gifted jumper of a hurdle. Um, just okay, I'd say. Uh, made a little mistake at the third last. Um, you know, Danny Mullins would have loved it to pan out a bit differently because he, he just ended up like this horse carted him into the race there um, after what, what was the, the second last and ended up right up the tail of State Man and, and Paul Townend. <laughs> you know, no no charity for the stable mates here. Paul Townend rode very tight around the, the bypass last. And like when you watch it back, like Vauban has gone from being on you know, very much on State Man's quarters to having checked back. And I'd say it's cost them somewhere between a length and a half and two lengths. But when it came down to it later on, he wasn't gaining. And I think State Man was actually going away from him again. So while I'm sure some will point to that and say, oh God, you know, he shaped better than the result. I think the, the end result um, was the State Man was still well on top. You know, granted, you have to consider Vauban may come on from the run. And this was, uh, you know, very much a step forward. We always talk about how difficult it is for juveniles to come into open company. Um, and look, we'll see. We'll see. We might get to see this again in the Irish champion hurdle. Would I be backing Vauban to reverse the form? God, you'd want to be getting a big price differential to tempt me now. And I don't think we'll get it because plenty of people seem very excited by Vauban. Yeah, lots of people, like you say, latching on to him, not just on the day, but on the in the aftermath as well. Um, a quick mention for the champion chase is one probably one of the open markets, TC, that didn't have uh, the biggest shakeup over the Christmas period due to obviously Edwardstown uh, not completing at Kempton. But and then Shakan obviously really disappointing at Leopardstown and Blue Law picking up the pieces there. Um, not a huge amount of excitement in champion chase market. But what did you make of that? No, I, I was very impressed by Blue Lord. Um, okay. The problem is, um, it's a typical willy factor, isn't it? You, you, do you back him for the champion chase, which the owners want to go for? Or if something does happen to Alaho, or, you know, Blue Lord may well just go to the Ryanair anyway. So the problem you've got there is, do you back him at eights for, you know, for both or, or there? So I've, uh, there was uh, some non runner no bet prices materialised on Sunday. I backed Blue Lord at five to one each way um, at uh, all, uh, non runner no bet, and just look at the shape of the race. Uh, you've got obviously you've got you've got the favourite there, Energy Mean. Uh, you've got Edward Stone, yeah. But I, I think Blue Lord is is the only genuine one that I want to back outside of that. I mean, I think it's I think on the exchange you probably get twenty to one bar bar those three so I'd hope Blue Lord goes there you know we know what we've got with Blue Lord I mean he should finish second in the Supreme and you know, he's got he's got ground to make up with Edward Stone on the arc all last year but on the on the basis of his two runs this season you know that defeat of Tornado Flyer and that uh, defeat of Captain Guinness yeah. uh, I think he's a much improved horse I think the fives no one I know bet is is very big price about Blue Lord yeah so um, yeah I was taken by it yeah OK, uh, Stairs Hurdle Division, Kevin, uh, we got to see the rearranged Long Walk Hurdle on Boxing Day over here at Kempton and um, Paisley Park winning that from Champ, who once again proved that he's best first time out and then starts to potentially deteriorate. Paisley Park picked up the pieces and great to see him back in the winner's enclosure. He's I don't know if we're really focusing on him when it comes to um, the Stayers hurdle at Cheltenham, but it was brilliant. I thought it was a heartwarming win from Paisley Park all the same. But really the focus for this division should be on home by the Lee at Kem um, after the win at Leopardstown, of course. Uh, now sixes from twenties, franking the Liz Mullen hurdle form and proving that that was no fluke. Uh, a, an excellent ride, I think it's fair to say, by JJ Slevin. Um, 
but now all of a sudden it's like people have really latched on to him in this second season in open divi- in open company as a genuine and proper stairs hurdle contender. Yeah, like, like I think this horse is really coming good. Um, like he, he's always been very talented. Like you look back through his form, like it's hard to believe it now. Like, but he was he was unbeaten in bumpers, you know, and he even over fences, which he didn't really like. Like he, he still got up to a mark of like 150. And over hurdles last season, and even in the Liz Mullen, like he was just capable of really frustrating you. He, he just get totally outpaced and or lose interest <laughs> and, and and get detached. Like it was a view that he, he didn't particularly like big fields and he didn't like being crowded because he just would back out of it, you know. And even in the Liz Mullen, he did what he did, but he still did it in the same style. Like he kind of backed out, you know, quite early. And it was JJ's perseverance that got him back in. And like he, he beat all the horses that he beat at Leopardstown. Um, but it just looked a bit weird, you know, because that's just the type of horse he is. But God, I noticed a big, big difference in him at Leopardstown now. Like really encouraging difference. Like for the first time in a long, long time, like he traveled. He Like JJ jumped him off prominent and he stayed prominent. And he never looked in any danger of not being prominent, you know, which is so unusual for him. And and to be honest, they're turning out of the back straight. I'm, I'm almost worried that it's, go, it's going too much in contrast to what we're used to because JJ is probably quite surprised. They're like, Jesus, this fella's still traveling and all of a sudden I'm in front um, and probably getting there sooner than he would have liked. But um, like he stays particularly well and he was good and strong up the run in. And like if he can kind of repeat this, and I know there's been a few changes made with him at home that they think might um, be contributing to this to what we saw at Leopardstown, like if he can kind of continue doing this and travel in his races and be able to hold a prominent position, like I think everyone's entitled to be, you know, looking forward to him at Cheltenham, et cetera, because he, he stays very well. He's very talented, you know, for all that he, he has quirks, you know, he does try. And I think we saw at Leopardstown that, that he is good enough. Um, like he wasn't beaten all that far in the race last year when he was doing the wrong thing. So mm-hmm. if, if he can get there and do the right thing, in a arguably a week or renewal potentially this 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 time around, yeah, you, you'd be pretty excited about him. Lots of people latching on to the fact that Florian Porter didn't look his usual sort of mad self TC in the race. You know, we know that he can do some quirky things and tends yeah. to take quite a keen and hold, and didn't really do that this time around with Danny. Um, so some sort of picking at the form line there, but I'm with Kevin. I think the six to one about home by the lead for this race where, you know, essentially it's a race that you end up getting a load of quirky horses in there because they end up there by default due to the fact they haven't taken to other disciplines normally. Um, so it can be a quirky division, but of all, like the case for home by the Lee is clear cut for me. Yeah, very similar to Blue Lord. I think I think we've got an improved horse on our hands. Only beaten seven and a half lengths in the in the race last year in a thirty three to one shot. And yeah, I mean, like like Kev said, the, the, the difference was the way the horse travelled into the race and won it really well. And I've got a lot of time for the runner up as well. So yeah, I mean, Florin Poor, there was a bit of an overreaction to that. I think one firm knocked him out to eight. That got I think that got knocked back in. But yeah, but the sevens about on the exchange about home by the Lee. Um, is is very very fair and we should say obviously Danny Mullins I think he picked up five day ban for dropping his hands there didn't he uh, yeah four four. yeah um I think yeah I mean, fair play to the stewards and they weren't they weren't getting fooled by the explanation that was given and I think we should get more we should get more you know stewards inquiry into into in, into certain uh, circumstances like that there was a possible one at Kempton over the Christmas period as well so yeah um Florian Porter, I'm sure we'll see a better horse at Cheltenham in, in March. But no, as it at a similar price now on the exchange, yeah, I'd be with home by the lead. OK, let's keep rattling on. On to the novice hurdlers, supreme pitcher. Fast Al Vega remains unbeaten, TC. Unchanged at evens for the supreme after adding another grade one to his CV, uh, but not impressing everyone in the process, I think it's fair to say. No, it was, I was looking at the exchange Um before and after, and he actually drifted a little bit on the back of that performance. Um, I Perfect. thought it was, I thought it was, I thought it was a very good performance. I mean, you can't go overboard about it because he beat a uh, beat a horse that was fifth fifth in the uh, triumph, only rated one hundred and thirty seven, and you know he only beat it by four lengths. But I, I was quite impressed by the by the manner of the performance. But uh, of course, you have to put everything into a price context, and he's he's, he's around about eleven to ten. Uh, on the exchange uh, for the Supreme. He's 
well odds on in places. And I just can't have that. Um, uh, I mean, it's like, you go back and have a look at the bumper form. Everyone's raving about the bumper form. That Cheltenham bumper form hasn't worked out exemplary. I mean, they are got some good performers come out of it, like likes of all for high speed, but it's, you know, that's it hit some bumps, uh, that kind of form. So I I can't go overboard about him whatsoever. I, I think he's a bad price. I think there's a horse in England who's literally 20 times the price, who's probably done more form-wise, and he's probably done equally as much on the clock, and that is rare addition, the Kempton winner. Now, yes. um, I was massively impressed by this one on Boxing Day. Um, he beat a horse of... Um, he beat a horse uh, of Nichols, his Ruber, which is, he came into that in really good form. And, you know, he's, I think the trainer will say, oh, there's, you know, the jump is left, you know, a bit to be worked on. But God, did he win there. And I love the way he pulled on after the last. The time is really, really well. Apparently, I know Constitution Hill didn't break sweat, but apparently it stacks up pretty well against Constitution Hill's uh, finishing splits and, yeah, I was massively impressed by Rare Edition. It's it's kind of like the young auntie and uncle situation, isn't it? If he was trained by Willie Mullins, he'd be fires rather than 20s. And his 20s with a sports book. He's 23 on the exchange. I think Rare Edition is a massive price for the Supreme. The only danger is, you know, he, he is um, a half-brother to the Florida Pearl winner, a uh, pencil full of lead. And, you know, they, they are rumbling on about him maybe looking for a step up in trip and, I think they'll keep him with Supreme. Um, they wouldn't, wouldn't want it too soft, but hopefully, you know, good to soft on the opening day. Uh, I'd be absolutely yeah. fine for it. And, and just had a look into where he's going to run next. They're talking about the Rossington Main on the uh, January the 21st, or maybe the Sydney Banks over an extended two mile three next month. But, you know, Shishkin won the um, Sydney Banks before winning the Supreme as well. Now, I think on form and on the clock, Rare edition is is pretty huge at twenty to one. I must admit, and I've got stuck in. And I've also backed him at fourteens, non one and no bet as well, in case they do go down the two mile four route. Okay, rare edition for the Longston team. Um, same price in the Supreme at twenty to one as high definition is after his hurdling debut and a winning hurdling debut at that, Kevin, for the Joseph O'Brien team. Like I say, 20 to 1 for the Supreme now. I thought that seemed quite big, given what we know about him. He beat a Mullins hot pot in the process. Of course, he's going to come on for the run, all the cliches, but uh, he's a fascinating contender in this in this division, isn't he? Yeah, like I'd be delighted with it myself. Um, like, you have to look at this race in the context that this horse only saw a hurdle for the first time in his life, you know, six weeks ago, you know, and he's been, he's been asked to jump out and make the running in a big field maiden hurdle. And like, I, I thought he showed an appetite for jumping. Like he was out to his right, but his technique was, was I thought perfectly acceptable other than that. And like the time of this race was, was quite strong. Um, it stacks up very well. And I, I thought this was really encouraging, Vanessa, because like don't, don't I just I just find I found it amusing after the race. Like I saw quite a bit of comment, though, you know, they'll surely go up and trip with him now, etc. Like for, for some, I don't, maybe it's just a racing Twitter thing, but this notion seemed to evolve around this horse when he was on the flat that he was a stayer and he needed a trip, etc. Like I, I just never saw that. Like I, I'm not I, to be honest, I, like genuinely, I, I'm not so sure how well he stayed a mile and a half on the flat. Like his best run, his clear best run was over 10 furlongs. And, you know, for me, that's the type of horse he was. He just fell a little bit short of the very highest level. And um, despite, you know, you know, winning a group two and, and nearly winning a very good group one. Um, and, and you just, I just would like the appetite he showed. You know, that's the main thing with a horse like this. They have to show an appetite because, um, you know, they can gallop. Um, and, you know, there's a huge amount of ability in there, but they just have to have an appetite for it. And, you know, given... The, the the difficulty of the test he was set there in making the running on his first spin with with such little jumping experience you know i thought it was really encouraging um i strongly suspect he'll go straight into grade one company at the dublin racing festival so he'll be going that way around again um but i'd say you could see kind of a different jumping performance from him if something goes on and gives him a lead you know i think the fact that he was in front there was probably a big contributor to him jumping out to his right like that. So, um, hey, look, I, 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 I'd be quite excited I, about I, it now. 
Okay. I concur about the, the speed angle, because every time I did a, a piece with Ryan on the flat about him, I just said, look, this horse doesn't stay on mile four. I know the Coronation Cup run was a really good run, uh, given what Hooken did. Um, but, yeah, I always had him down as a mile two horse. Um, and the fascinating thing about that performance as well, that winning performance over hurdles is, he was just right ridiculous. C- c- considering the platform, he went off at a bet for SP of 9.94 for that kind of race and considering his flat credentials. I think that was that that's again Mullins fact with everyone getting overexcited about par, par many, what however the fuck you say the, <laughs> the third place horse, that French recruit. I think there was a lot of there seemed to be quite a lot of hype behind him. Yeah, there was there was giant Shah heard some kind of very punchy lines about him there in the weeks building up to it. Yeah. And like I know there was everyone, I think, put two and two together with the with the drift on high definition and that he, he must have schooled badly, etc. But he but he didn't like he was <laughs> he was fine, he was fine, you know. So that that yeah. that wasn't driving that but look the market can do funny things at times and like tc says it was it wasn't a, a really like a wow sort of a drift but yeah. um, but there you go lads Drif- drifters do win just one other thing about um we did mention the facile vega race just I'll, I'll just put it out there and we'll leave it there go and have a look at the run of ash road diamond in third in that race talking about or maybe horses for another day that was okay a, was a okay massive yeah. put that out there yeah, uh, and just, just on Fasa Vega briefly, Vanessa, like I have a feeling like I, I'd be with TC to an extent in that do I think he should be quite that short? I'm not so sure, but I, I, I keep getting flashbacks to occasions in the past with William Mullins novices that I've gone picking at because their their first few runs over hurdles I didn't think justified the price they were for Cheltenham. And they've gone to Cheltenham and just made such a leap forward. Yeah, because you know, we know that we know that's the way Willie trains. Like he, he tightens the screw to be at its tightest for Cheltenham, and we've yeah. seen it just a, a bunch of times before. And I'm just I get that little feeling with Fasal Vega. Like I, I I like his jumping technique. I think he's very intelligent. Like he, he seems to be able to work it out and correct himself and get get where he needs to be, um, very readily. Um, and like he only got one little one little sting of the persuader. The other day and was going away at the line. I I'd, I'd say like we we haven't seen his tank dipped at all. Over no, I don't think yet. we have. But there's no there's no juice in his price at all. It's not like a no, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Not like a classical dream that can come out of nowhere on the day and shit up. No, yeah. he's very short price. But in terms of mm. just like not even you know take like moving away from the betting angle, people who would kind of like deflate it, not deflated, but there seems to be some people who were a bit disappointed after, despite the fact he'd won after Leopardstown, just wasn't didn't do it in quite the fashion they were after. But I'm with you, Kevin. I think we're not even seeing half of his ability. Well, not that's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean. I think we've got a long way to go before we see him at the be- his best this season, and it'll be in March and April. I would have. Imagine. Uh, on we go because we've got still got so much to talk about. Um, the longer staying novice hurdlers, obviously Hermes Allen adds another um, a competitive looking chalo uh, to the CV for Nichols and Cobden, and another Grade One over the Christmas period for them is now the seven to two joint favourite for the Ballymore TC. And also, we've all been caught putting a good performance uh, for a sort of campaign. Uh, either, well, either the Ballymore, but looks more likely to be in the Albert Bartlett. Those were just a few of the noteworthy, more staying performances over here. Um, and obviously, they've got the form together. So, who were you? Who were you impressed by? I suppose. Well, you had to be, didn't you? I mean, I actually laid Hermes Allen, and I didn't want to see any of that race ever again. Uh, <laughs> Tough race to watch if you live. Oh, it was like, kind of like, you know, what? You just knew you just uh, your money. It was like very impressive. You know, if people are kind of like pulling the form down because, you know, Stage Star and Brave Man's Game, the two previous winners of that race have both gone to, you know, haven't, haven't done the business at Chelsea afterwards. I think they're barking out the wrong tree, but seven to two, maybe got, probably going straight there. And you, but you know, you've got any number of Willie Mullins sauce that you know can rock up against. Yeah. I'm a massive fan of you know Gaelic Warrior. You know, um, I'm a big fan of Grange Clear West. But are they going to go three miles or the two mile four? You know, you know this horse is going there. You know he's got Cheltenham form. You know he's done it ridiculously 
um, ridiculously well, got form of good ground. That that ground at Newbury deteriorated very, very quickly. Uh, and he still got it done there. Uh, you had to be impressed, and I'm not quibbling with seven to two, four to one on the exchange. Okay, fair enough. Um, on to the novice chase as we go. Unless Kevin, you don't have anything to add, do you? There, no. We I'm... should maybe mention a quick mention of the triumph because um, obviously Lossy Mouth come out and won and out so around about seven to four. All right, pal. We haven't got down that far on the running. <laughs> <way. laughs> no. well, I thought we were going. To, I thought we were doing the hurdlers, and then oh, so I'll shut up. Sorry. <laughs> I am driving this ship, TC. Come on now. Uh, <laughs> after racing only better, I thought I might steer you in the right yeah, direction. I know. Well, that is fair after last week's <laughs> shit show of a podcast. But anyway, onwards we go. Novice chasers. Here you go, TC. You can take this away. He seems just gagging to get going. Um, Jerry Colomb continued his unbeaten record down at Limerick in the Fahim Novices chase. And he's now five to one from eights for the Brown Advisory. And in the same race, we saw obviously the real wacko in the Dipper at Cheltenham has been introduced at 20s. He jumped them into submission. And uh, like I said, 20s for the Brown Advisory and 33s for the Turners. Love that story. Owned, trained and led up by Patrick Neville. Go on, like in a, in a Christmas period where we've been dominated by the big names. I like things like that. Then elsewhere, you've got the likes of James de Burley as, as well. Another one for Willie Mullins made a winning chasing debut at Fairy House. Is now eights from 12s um, for the Turners and 10s from 14s for the Brown Advisory. Those are just a few of the names mentioned, TC. Of those, um, a few of the good performances, I should say. Uh, is anything tickling your fancy at this stage? We can sit here and say the novice chasers jumped well, won well, continued their unbeaten record, whatever it might be. But what, if anything, has jumped out? the page at you over the Christmas period? From a betting perspective, uh, none, nothing, because we don't know where they're going to go. I mean, the Brown Advisory is a classic example. Nightmare. It's 9.2 the field on the exchange, and this and the lowest price that's being asked for in the market, and whenever you look at a market, don't look at the price that's on offer, look at the look at the prices, you know, people are willing to back horses at. So the actual lay side is probably more relevant than, than the backside. It's, you know, the it's 14 is the, is, the low, is the lowest price anybody's looking to back something in the Brown Advisory. Nobody knows where anything's going. And it's, you know, I it's, think... It's, it's, all, it's, it's almost as if, now I'm just going to throw this out there. <laughs> it's, almost, it's almost as if having four novice chases at the Cheltenham Festival is a bad idea. I but I'm just throwing it out there. Just you I, I, ahead. I was teeing you up. Kev, I wasn't teeing you up for that. <laughs> I was teeing you up for the Willie Mullins domination. The Willie oh, Mullins bingo. Nice oh, yeah. yeah well, we've got a lot of that because... any, look at any, well, we'll come on to the triumph a bit later if, if we're allowed. Any Vanessa, if you look at the novice chases, you just don't know where they're going to go. Uh, Honestly, Asher, yeah. Asher isn't, that, isn't that the joy of it, Tony? It's the guessing game, it's not knowing, it's complete ignorance of what's going to happen. Like, you, you, know, you have to love that, don't you? Brilliant. I mean, Gaylord de Manil <laughs> from nine to four for the National Hunt Chase, and then also Gentleman's Game 12s from third, um, sorry, tens from twenties for the National Hunt Chase. Two horses that obviously won at Leopardstown. In fact, Gentleman's Game, one for Nick Luck. You the guys know about that? Yeah, 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 fantastic. Bred yeah. by Nick Luck. Absolutely brilliant. Congratulations. Yeah, and, and uh, I know it meant an awful lot now because Nick lost his mother recently yeah. and um, she, she was a, a big, big part of all of that. So yeah. I know he would have got a, a particular kick out of that. So so many congrats to, to all of them. That he was a high point. Garden in, in Teddington, there's mostly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, just, just, quick, just quickly on that, Vanessa, yeah. imagine, imagine how glorious it would be Right, it is a magical, mystical universe. If we just had the Arkle and the Brown Advisory, imagine how different these conversations would be. But there'd be, there'd be no doubt, really, would there? It'd be, there'd be no doubt. It'd be much easier. You'd have a pretty good idea of what was going where. You know, ten weeks to go, you could really build and have some fun. But we're not allowed to have fun in this game anymore, are we? No, instead, the classic one is. I leave Gallard. it at that. I leave it at that. The classic one is Gala de, de Manil. Because obviously, we've got the national one trade. I mean, everything about that horse suggests to me he should be going and, uh, and winning the Browns again over three yeah, miles. Absolutely. absolutely. Obviously, he's got, obviously, he's third in an Irish Grand National, but the speed he showed against Mighty Potter over two mile four first time out. Uh, and I thought he was really impressive over three miles again, albeit that was a, you know, that was a, obviously, a regrettable race in, in many respects. 
I mean, that horse should be going and winning the free miler. You know, it should be talking yeah. about the free mile yeah. five. It, and it will be about a set, three to one really seventy-two for that as well. But we should also just say that um, obviously Gaylord de Manil won the Neville's Hotel Novices Chase and that was where it was a pretty sad, well, a very sad postscript actually to that mm. race. Pretty a tough viewing. We lost both three stripe life and um, unexpected depth as well, both fatally injured. And I must say in the moment that really, yeah, that took a, took a lot away from that race, obviously. Um, so condolences to all connected with those horses. Nobody wants to see that. Let's move on to the Triumph Hurdle because TC is clearly just so excited about the juveniles. Lossy Mouth won at Leopardstown. Comfort Zone won the finale, is now 14s from 20s. Didn't do it quite in the style that we were expecting of him. Lossy Mouth did it in the style we were expecting of her at Leopardstown. And then you have that Jupiter de Jeep thing, winning at 66 to 1, Big. having won a bloody trotting race. I mean, as always, <laughs> and on top of all of that, we had the sort of, you'll be able to touch on this, TC. I don't know if this is where you're going with this, but all the chat beforehand seemed, and the money maybe seemed to be behind the second string of Willie Mullins's in that Leopardstown race that finished second in the end. Um, can't even remember its name at the moment. There's a lot of hype about that horse as well. So, well, was that the Kenny Alexander horse? Yeah. Ga Gala Masso. Gala Masso, yeah. I mean, that was a, again, that was a, that was a real big eye catch. I mean, yeah. Again, if you don't know where, you know, the two fillies, you know, the first two places there. Yeah, yeah, I thought the second ran a really good race. It was a slowly run race and the winner's obviously very, very quick. But yeah, I thought the Kenny Alexander horse, um, you know, shaped really well there. It was a fascinating, you know, a week for the for the Triumph horses. You've got, obviously, you've got the Gary Moore thing, as you like to say. Um, <laughs> well, it's just, uh, that, that was pretty extraordinary, to be fair to you. That was actually. Yeah. And it, I'll tell you what was more yeah. extraordinary. I bet... Um, the horse in second, Klitschko. If they knew Jet Power was gonna was gonna shit out, I think Klitschko might have beaten him. Go and have a look at the Klitschko run. I mean, that is a that's a second run over hurdles. That is a more handicap project if ever I saw, saw one. So keep an eye on Klitschko. Um, but in terms of Jupiter GG, like how it's very rare that the Moors you know you see a horse win for the moors off that sort of price like they know what they've got at home they're a shrewd operation and this horse clearly given all the quotes afterwards is nothing short of an absolute lunatic <laughs> oh, but geez, mate, like i said I, I i will take it i don't know what the time was like but like i said the one of the second made me chuckle um obviously jet power i mean even speaking to nico you know beforehand it's not you know they were they weren't they didn't think they had a superstar on their hands and that was the second favorite for the supreme i mean clearly he didn't run his race but yeah it was a that was an interesting um weekend uh, week across the board for that don't remember script writer or old mate milton that horse won off a mark of 102 at wolverhampton did indeed uh, yeah uh, you know, she got child reform you know, you know, not that many horses with a mark of 102. You know, it just shows you the class of horses that we are getting, you know, high definition and like we are getting. And then Wolverhampton, Wolverhampton was a big price to get a mention on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> like said, Anything a, goes, Kevin. Anything goes. 102. And he's got the Cheltenham for I mean, he beat Perseus Way there. And Perseus Way didn't run that badly behind um, the Joseph O'Brien horse comfort zone. It's, it's really? it might have gone under the radar of it because that is a. That was a big. That was a big win on the flat. Who would have thought we'd be sat here getting so overexcited about the bloody <laughs> Triumph Hurdle? Anyway, and and the same about the Mayor's <laughs> Chase, which we're about to move on to because the Mayor's Chase is... move on. Kevin. Yeah. Yeah, we're moving on. Um, <laughs> Allegor de Bassi is now five to two for the Mayor's Chase after her impressive uh, chase debut. She won the Limerick Grade Two, short price, but it was an emphatic style. Don't know about the depth of the race, but you couldn't help but being impressed by the way she jumped and sort of the way she went about it. But then Scarlet and Dove came out yesterday, Kevin, and turned the tables with Dolcita at Fairy House. She's going to go back to the Mayor's Chase, and um, you wouldn't put it past her to put in another fine showing on that evidence as well. No, you'd be delighted with her now. Um, it was, you know, it, I think everyone's been very open about it. It wasn't a shock that she improved because she is a, a big gross mare that, that improves with um, with racing. And it was really good. Like she can be a little bit kind of reckless with her jumping at times, but she kept it kind of good and low without being dangerously low. Um, yesterday, I thought she was quite good, good and strong up the run in. Um, like you, 
you look back at her run in, in the mayor's chase last year, and if, if it panned out slightly differently, I feel she might have won. It was just a bit unfortunate on the day. And you'd be hopeful that she's certainly as good this year. And I think that level of form will be enough to, to put her in the mix again. Um, then you look at the complete other end of the scale in Allegory Devassi, just having her first run over fences compared to Scarlett and Dove, who, who's had a million. And um, yeah, you'd have to be impressed with her now, Vanessa. Look, grade two, Mayor's Chase, not great depth. Um, no. But Allegory Devassi was very good. A um, little bit airy, I'd say, early on, but she kind of got flatter as the race went. Um, and she was kind of, she was very good up until kind of took off a little bit too early um, at the second last and ended up kind of going through it. And then it was a little bit messy um, when, when she was asked just to pop the last, but look very good. It's interesting. I think since this mayor's novice chase has come in, sorry, the mayor's chase at Cheltenham that, you know, previously plenty of these top trainers would have, would have, you know, reacted in a horrified manner if you suggested they run their their novices in open company at Cheltenham. But since the, the Mayor's Chase has come in, they seem very, very happy to put in uh, their novices in against the, the older uh, the older mayors, the more experienced mayors. And it sounds like that's where we're going to go with, uh, with Allegory de Vassi. Looking on the mayor's um, did I did I read that JP's bought impervious? Is that? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she's a lovely mayor now. She, she's staying with Colin Murphy, as far as I know. And um, I was, in, we, we, I think we we're all impressed with her the last day. Yeah. yeah so looking forward to seeing her again. Dino Blue, didn't she? So I imagine, yeah. I imagine they were quite questful, and so they bought the winner. Yeah. Yeah. She'll, 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 be, she'll be in the mix, I'd say, in that race again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hopefully they'll keep the train and keep the jockey that'd be nice um, on we go to news topics guys because there are a few topics to discuss away from the racing action on the track um, but I suppose the one that ties in with everything we've just been talking about is the Mullins domination is it a bit dull or as the headline in whatever paper it was Mullins Dullins <laughs> uh, obviously had six winners was it from seven races on the 27th at Leopardstown has had 27 winners from 105 runners over the last uh, two weeks and obviously the large chunk of those in the Christmas racing period between uh, Christmas Day and now. And a lot of people will say that it's pretty boring having the domination of one big yard in such a way. Other people, Kevin, will say that, you know, having someone that's so far sort of superior brings everyone up to their level, you know, gives everyone something to aim at. And it, we've been here before with this, like, it's not going to change the Willie Mullins domination. Yeah, it's not a new thing. Like it's been the case for probably kind of, you know, over a decade probably now. Like Gordon got upsides him to an extent a few years ago. Um, and now Willie's back heavily in charge again. And look, it, it is a bit dull. You know, it is a bit dull. You can't you can't escape that. Um, you know, Willie looked mortified really as, as last I think last Tuesday was progressing and he won you know whatever six out of the seven races of the cards he looked embarrassed to be you know being interviewed again and again um and look at in a perfect world you would have more variety this isn't the perfect world um Willie and his team are exceptional at what they do they, they've worked their way to the position they're in but look I suppose just for the sake of the, the conversation like if you look at pretty much any other sport in the world and I know we're an industry as a masquerading as a sport to an extent like they have systems in place sort of stuff like this doesn't happen you know where you're talking about the draft system in the NFL um, you know the, 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 the tight controls they have in the Formula 1 to make sure that no one gets a big advantage um, you know financial fair play in football you know in our own game in racing like in, in Japan and Hong Kong you know yards are restricted to a maximum number of horses you know it's designed so that no one gets to a position of dominance because that's not good for sport sport is supposed to be competitive and um and interesting uh, and right now like willie is, is holding all the aces again um what do you do to change it i don't think you can march into willie mullins and say no sorry willie you're only allowed of 100 in training i don't think you can do that but uh what you could do as i kind of gibber on about and i won't go on here you can you could do a lot with the program to um make the thing more competitive you know namely more handicaps i, I think willie would still be champion trainer by a mile but it would get you a bit more variety in terms of um you know every you know everything trainers you know, jockeys, you know owners you know what's frightening with Willie? It's about the horses. Apparently, he's still got to to run uh, in yeah. twenty twenty three. As we got as we got to Cheltenham, and also look, we you talk about Fasol Vega. He had a horse yesterday 
Indiana Dream, JP horse, one by 15 lengths. And he beat the horse, he was beating the horse there that was beaten 14 lengths by Fasal Vega, um, a horse of Gordon Elliott, whose name escapes me, very short, very short name. It's just so many horses are just coming out and winning, and nobody really gives them a passing mention. But in any other stable, they'd literally be the stable star. It is yeah. right. I mean, the, the and, big, the, and there are and there are consequences, big. Vanessa. Like, because look, yeah. it'll it'll wind it'll wind people up because you know National Hunt Racing has has a lot of very loyal acolytes. But the way jump racing has moved there in the last ten years, like for me, flat racing has accelerated so far clear of national hunt racing as an entertainment product it, it's unnatural like like consistently i think jump racing is, is is quite dull you know it always has the the potential to produce like unbelievable sport and great stories etc but when you when you put the two against each other in terms of their their general health and the consistency of their product like i, I don't think they're comparable anymore and that'll wind a load of people up but i, I really mean- believe it the big thing that we haven't mentioned, though, there, and when you're referring to, like, Formula One teams, football teams, NFL teams, they're a team, obviously. Um, whereas with racing, a trainer isn't the team. You're looking at the owner. We haven't even mentioned the owners. And I haven't gone back through the numbers. But the amount of different owners that Willie trains for, you know, like, you that's the bit that I don't find boring, is it's not just the same colours in the winner's enclosure. He trains for a variety of different people at a variety of different levels with a variety of different jockeys on a lot of the time. And and so it's not a team element because you're not getting, it's not the same owner, trainer and jockey. But that's- I, know we, I know we've got to move on, but the thing about it is the owners at Willie Mullins literally have z- zero impact on where the horse is going to go. You, when you have a horse with Willie Mullins, you basically, you just give him carte blanche to do what he wants and he'll tell you after he's made the decision. I mean, I know that that sounds flippant, but that is the way it works. So the owners is, is, is a great element to it, the number of different owners, but all the power lies in one man. Yeah, that that is yeah, I, that is true. But it's just it is worth mentioning that that for me is where the big difference is. And yeah, but you, it is essentially the same thing, though. You know, they're different colours, but they're controlled, as TC says, by by the same man. You know, which, which is which brings issues in itself in that horses getting moved around the chessboard, etc., um, rather than whacking heads. But again, I, I I don't want to sound like I'm knocking Willie or anything he's done because like the, the, that whole team is just exceptional. But I think it's it's something that there is scope within national racing. There is a freedom within national racing to do a lot with the program. You know. I, in comparison to the flat where there's wider international controls, you can't do what you want. They can do what they want with the jumps. And I think you could tackle the issue of, of you know, lack of lack of variety in terms of winners. You know, I think you can tackle that via the program book if they so wish. Now, do they have the, the cojones to do it? I very much doubt it, to be honest. No. OK, we've got to move on because there's been a couple of articles in the written press of late TC that have caught your eye. Uh, Joe Soma of Smith interview with Lee Moth said in the Racing Post over a week ago now, that was at Christmas time, uh, had some points in there that I know you want to bring up. But we'll start with the Paul Kimmage piece that was um, in the paper yesterday, uh, sort of linking back to the John Warwick case we spent a lot of 2022 talking about. Was there anything new in the Kimmage piece? Anything that we, if anyone missed it, that will raise an eyebrow or two? Not really. I thought I thought it was a, a rambling poor piece, but... I do think there's I do think there is a um there's a story to be written um about you know drugs in racing and stuff like that. I'd be very naive to think that it's not a factor in our sport like it is in every other sport. But you know, he hasn't brought anything forward on on, on his most recent articles, but he did make the point about what's happened with the John Warwick case, and that was 15 months ago. And that was, you know, that was pretty, pretty shocking stuff, wasn't it? You know, trainers getting you know, stopped at the gate, you know, asking, you know, uh, being asked any number of questions, the horses being inspected, etc. And it all's gone, it's all gone very, very quiet there. So he does raise a very good point there about the lack of follow-up to that. So what what's actually been happening over there, Kev? Anything? Yeah, look, that it's not a surprise as such, Tony. And I'm, I'm certain we would have made this point when we were discussing it in detail at the time. 
that like don't be holding your breath waiting for new information or conclusion to this because it's in the hands of the the Irish court system which is just exceptionally slow and like we we see this again and again and anytime something gets into the court system you you're sir I, I think I might have speculated don't don't expect anything for a year maybe two um, because that's the way these things tend to pan out um, it's the system we have it's far from ideal and it's frustrating because we'd all like to know the nature of, of what was found there um, but look be, being I suppose familiar with this with this type of case and there has been a few over the years you know you need to view this case in the, in the overall context of, of the veterinary profession in Ireland um, John Warwick is not a vet but in terms of available medications like it's an important context to have because in Ireland the amount of medications like like legitimate routine antibiotics anti-inflammatories the number that vets have access to is very very small um, and the reason is that Ireland is a very small market and a lot of the big drugs companies don't consider it worth their while to license a lot of very common drugs here so I know it's a constant frustration for the veterinary profession that they can't get hold uh, of pretty routine drugs to treat the horses that are in front of them. And sometimes some people will take the law into their own hands and get hold of drugs that can be, you know, bought and given legally up in Northern Ireland, but not in the Republic. And they'll get hold of them and bring them down to the South and they get caught. And that's what will usually be referred to as unauthorized animal remedies. Uh, and people, you know, get a bit kimmy about that and think it sounds very sinister. But um, in the vast majority of cases that, that have come to public attention, um, it, it hasn't been sinister. And, you know, I don't know what they found at John Warwick's. None of us do. But um, so we'll wait and see what, what pans out. But I think if, yeah. uh, if, if someone was running a book on it, it would be probably heavy odds on that um, it, it was the type of situation yeah. that I described there. That's Susie Dent's. A uh, word of the day tomorrow, Kimidry. Yeah, a Kimidry. Kimidry. Love that. Absolutely love that. Yeah. That is that is sensational from you, Kevin, to shoehorn that in there. Um, <laughs> what about Joe Somer Smith, TC? We're running out of time, but I know there was a few points in that article or that interview, I should say, that caught your eye. No, I mean, if you haven't read it, it's the most extraordinary kind of like uh, self-congratulating piece about his punting you ever meet. Uh, uh, you'd ever see from Joe Somer Smith in a piece he did with Lee Mottlesbed last month. Um, yeah, I mean, he's talking about betting on credit accounts with Heathorns at the age of 12, etc. And you go and have a look. He, he's obviously an incredibly bright, a bright guy who's, you know, go and have a look at his Wikipedia page. It's, it's, it's quite something to behold, you know. You know, he's, I, anyway, so it, it was, I think it was misjudged, but it, it does, it did make many people chuckle. Two people who wouldn't normally direct message me actually said on the morning when I hadn't read it, he said, you've got to read this. He said, you will not believe it. And these are quite mild mannered people. They were just like, kind of like laughing at him, but I won't mention their names, obviously. But it, there was a follow up today in Lee Mottleshead's piece in the Racing Post saying about how, um, you know, he's, you know, he's, you know, about bookmakers get a lot of press about bad press about you know shutting accounts and stuff like that and he made the point about he knows pro punters that try to try open 200 bet 365 accounts every single week and i just thought well that's bollocks isn't it but i asked around this morning apparently yes yeah, they, they can believe it um but again it's 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 all too easy saying i'll oh, bookmaker and i'm not being an apologist for a bookmaker i'm on the wrong end of these kind of things all the time but I, I really don't like people. They keep on saying, oh, you know, minimum bet to, to lay and to lose, et cetera, and bookmakers should stop her with sticks in accounts. There's nothing in that piece today that gives a solution. It's all right for someone in the BHA position saying, I've won chunks, but, you know, bookmakers, you know, should be laying people bets. You know, if, if you are taking money consistently off a bookmaker, <laughs> you know, there is no way around it. There, you know, and unless you can... I've stopped moaning about it because there is no solution. Bookmakers are businesses and they will not tolerate people consistently taking money off them. End of. I mean, he, he can bleat as much as he wants uh, as a BHA chairman. And, and he has been on the BHA board for nine years now. So it's not as if he's a, you know, a new broom coming in here. And, you know, he, he's been in a position of relative power for, for nine years. But, yeah, I mean, I, if, if you're going to if you're going to come out from his position and say bookmakers should do more and lay people give a solution because otherwise it's just hot air and it's typical BHA speak talk the talk 
but you don't walk the walk. We okay. have a solution, TC. Oh, no. the, the Spanish way. We can go like they've gone in Spain. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. They, 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 yeah. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Law. Restrictions are no longer permitted by law. Yeah. Uh, it's been a complete um, a complete free-for-all, which is really interesting to see it pan out. And I suppose you can look to Australia for the way they tackle the, the minimum bet limits and different sort of betting culture down there. But um, I suppose there are ways, just in general, like I, I actually quite enjoyed the interview. I thought it was refreshing, TC, just from the point of view of how many prominent people in racing politics you know have any interest in having a bet full stop have any even the most basic understanding of betting and racing like there hasn't been too many over the years and i i saw this as as, as sort of one of us you know and i know you can you can pick you can pick at the after timing etc you know but I, I i found it quite refreshing that he was willing to talk in, in that manner publicly because i know a lot of people in racing politics number one they wouldn't have any experience to draw on from from, from betting but if they did they would be very reticent about it they so would. you know I, I, for me for me that's a positive you know i think we, we we forever we've been saying for how many years that you know the that racing politicians uh, and administrators need to be more cognizant of the betting public and their interests many of which should be married up to, to the overall interest of the sport. And I think having someone in a very prominent position that's kind of been in the trenches there and, and has an understanding and is, has, you know, lots of people to draw on in that, in that world, I think that's a positive thing for the me. The problem was, it, okay. was all about, it was all about him and it completely policy lie. But, yeah. Okay, let's move on. We've given that enough time. Human talent drain. We talk about uh, the drain of talent in the when it comes to horses, plenty from the sales, uh, specifically on the flat, horses going abroad, et cetera, et cetera, and the horse talent drain. But there's also a bit of a human talent drain that's coming to uh, the fore at the moment. And this has recently been brought into the headlines courtesy of Grace McEntee, who's a very talented jockey over here, a claimer, been riding a lot for, obviously, her dad, Phil McEntee, but now she has set sail to America. America. Um, she does have a family connection over there. Her uncle trains over there and her brother, Jake McEntee, is also based over there. So it's not completely out the blue. But for somebody who rides winners regularly over here in the UK and for me is a very um, capable young jockey that, you know, as was, is the case for so many of those people at that level and that stage in their career, they're just looking for a good horse and an owner or a trainer to give them a chance. Um, it's sad to see her go. Uh, I don't know who to start with. Let's go to Kevin with this. I think it was you who brought this topic up. Um, and it's an interesting, uh, not interesting, it's kind of a worrying development, I guess, going forward if this keeps happening. Because the likes of Great Grace McEntee should have a future here in the UK, but it's sad that they feel like they don't and they have to go abroad to continue their career. Um, well, look, they can have a future all they want, but they could have a much more lucrative future abroad. That's the that's the simple fact of the matter. Um, like when, when we're talking about the, the horse, the, the equine talent train there a few months ago, you know, this came up, the dangers of this. And like you won't, there's so many examples like in both America and Australia, like Australia, like look at Rachel King. You know, she rode as an amateur over here, rode a handful of winners and she's absolutely smashed it in Australia, riding group one winners, Johnny Allen. You know, journeyman jump jockey in Ireland has gone over and you know won Cox Plates. Yeah. Um, Rob Robbie Dolan, apprentice that was probably struggling, has gone over and um, is on Australia. He's got talent as well as riding loads of winners. But um, like th there's loads of examples. Sophie Doyle gone to America, um, and the only thing that keeps these lads at home is 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 just the fact that it's home and yeah. it's what they're familiar with and moving abroad can be a bit daunting and, and you know getting going can be a challenge but uh, I suspect we'll see more and more of it and like to be honest I, I've said it to a few lads in the last couple of years like you know would, would you not go to us you know like things aren't you're in Ireland in particular like it's a, it can be a real struggle and talented talented lads that you know in your heart of hearts that if they went out and gave it a good crack and stuck at it they could do great things for themselves. But I, I think a lot of them are, are home birds and I, I don't want to make that jump, but I would be fearful that you know it, it will start happening more because it makes every financial uh, and career sense in the world to give it a crack. Yeah. Well, Grace's case is, like, as you, as you mentioned, Vanessa, Grace's case is probably 
not the norm because she's got a massive family network out there. She's going out there. She's, I think her first ride was in a 125 grand race uh, for her uncle. And it's, but it's not only about the money. And, and I think part of the problem is over here. I mean, I hate this obsession with giving money to the top end and not building from the bottom up because, you know, if you're getting six, seven, eight percent of, of a two grand win, I mean, you know, trying to make a living over here is it's impossible. But you go, it's not only the finances you go over there and, and, and running, you know, 50 grand claimers and maidens and whatever. It's a quality of life as well. I mean, I imagine it's, is it, do a lot of the, she's gone over to Turfway, for example. I'd imagine, do they just train on the track? Uh, in, yeah, in, you just in, stay at the track. Oh, yeah, you're not on the roads. All none day. of the travelling. You know, you you know, you you ride your work in the mornings. Yeah, I think they race four times a week in Turfway. I think she was saying, you know, the quality of life that you would have over there, in addition to the money, it's kind of like you know, it's yeah, it's, you're selling it too well. Yeah, yeah. The, the Middle East, the Middle East will become more of a thing as well, like because the the lifestyle over there will suit plenty as well. You know, often often earning tax free. You know, you're getting up very early in the morning to ride out, but then you. You're free to do what you want for the rest of the day. In many cases, it's it, it'll it'll be proving and like staffing is already a big big problem in Ireland and the UK. Um, quality yeah. riders, quality ground staff, it's a challenge. And like I, as we mentioned in the context of the talent train, like the Middle East in particular is only going to get bigger and bigger. And it's not just horses they're going to need; they're going to need you know talented people as well. So it's something we need to be very aware of and very protective of because because we need those people and we need those horses. Well, they we better relax the drink laws out then if they're going to get more jockeys over. <laughs> Uh -uh. <laughs> um, guys that's that about wraps up the show our first show of 2023 um we will net from next week be starting the footsteps to the festival series we did last i've started already i started a week early well, we really early. did start it this week to be honest given the chat that we've been having but it will start officially next week so do stay tuned to that as we build up to the Cheltenham Festival and now we're into the new year nobody's allowed to slate us for focusing in on the Cheltenham Festival because it's only natural now okay um, but for now as always thanks very much for listening tune in again on Thursday where we'll have racing only better and I can promise you that I'm going to put in a better effort than I did last week when it comes to that show. So that would not be difficult because the level was set very low. Everyone um, loves a car crash, Vanessa. Nah, car, <laughs> car crash podcast, car crash trip to Ireland. Anyway. No, I'm talking about my tips. Oh. oh. <laughs> not your presenting. I, well, I was talking about the fact that I actually had a car crash in Ireland. Really? I thought that's what really? you did. No, I didn't, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought you were referring to. No, I didn't. Did you have a car crash? Yeah, the old hire car took a bit of a battering. Don't start. It's a long story. I don't want to get into it. Now's not the time. All the platform. We're moving on. As always, guys, thanks to you two. And thanks very much for listening. Join us on Thursday. That was Wade In. Have a happy new year.